Welcome everyone. We were just waiting, giving folks an opportunity to join once the webinar started. We'll go ahead and get started now. I'm Patty Ferris-Azidis and I'm the Assistant Director of a Division for Advancing Prevention and Treatment, ADAPT. For those new to ADAPT, we are funded as the Training and Technical Assistance Division for the National HIDA program in their substance use prevention work. We are thrilled to have you join us for today's evidence-based practice spotlight on the PACS Good Behavior Game. Before we get started, I would like to share with everyone the purpose of the Evidence-Based Practice Spotlight series, as this may be the first one that you're joining with us. There are three main goals in this series. The first is really to highlight best and promising substance use prevention strategies that are currently being used or could be used in HIDA communities. The second goal is to help our audience to understand and think through the evidence that leads to an evidence-based practice designation for these best and promising prevention strategies from the lens of the CDC's Understanding Evidence Framework. Our thinking is that by preparing preventionists and decision makers in this way of thinking, this will support you when thinking through and ultimately selecting strategies to support or implement. Lastly, our final goal is to connect you to resources and training opportunities for the strategy being presented. So these resources will be provided to you today in the form of a resource supplement, which we will share in the chat box during the webinar. And we'll also send to you via email about one to two days following the webinar. So you have that in two locations. So before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items so that you know how to participate in today's event. We are using Zoom webinar. So by default, your video is turned off and your sound is muted. Also, the attendee to attendee chat feature has been disabled. So event hosts will use the chat to send information relevant to the webinar. And if you experience any technical issues during the webinar, you'll be able to use the chat to send a message to the host. Please send that to me and we'll go ahead and try to get that resolved for you. We hope that you will engage with the presenters and ask questions by sending your thoughts, your reactions, and any of your questions to us using the Q&A feature. We have dedicated ample time to having a conversation towards the um, last bit of today's webinar. So go ahead and get those submitted and we will be sure to get those synthesized and covered when we get into our Q&A session. I do wanna remind everyone that the sessions are being recorded. So the recording will be made available on the ADAPT YouTube channel and we'll send you the um, the email with that link as early as tomorrow. So lastly, when the webinar ends, a post-presentation evaluation will open for you. We would really appreciate if you would take a couple of minutes to go ahead and provide us your feedback on your experience with today's event. By completing that evaluation, you will also have the opportunity to provide your name and email address if you would like to receive 1.5 free continuing education credits for today's webinar. So now that we're done with the housekeeping, I'd like to thank our presenters and contributors to today's webinar. So starting with the ADAPT team who works together to support these trainings, a special thank you to our director, Laura Papard, who envisioned this training series and also be serving as Q&A moderator today. And Rebecca Bates, our technical assistance program manager, who will guide us through the CDC understanding evidence framework a little later in the webinar. So now for our presenters, it has been a pleasure getting to know them and we're thrilled they are here to share their important work with you today. Dr. Dennis Embry, Carmen Irving, and Dr. Dennis, uh, sorry, Dr. Jason Frew. Dr. Dennis Embry is a prominent prevention scientist, trained as a clinician and developmental child psychologist. He's president senior scientist at the Paxis Institute in Tucson and co-investigator at Johns Hopkins University and the Manitoba Center for Health Policy. Dr. Embry serves um, on the U.S. Center for Mental Health Services National Advisory Council and Chief Science Advisor to the Children's Mental Health Network. In 2020, the Child Welfare League of America named Dr. Embry as one of 100 people in the last 100 years to improve the well-being of children. His work and that of colleagues has been cited in the 2009 Institute of Medicine report on the prevention of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders among young people. Clinically, his work has focused on children and adults with serious mental illness. In March 2014, his work and work of several signatories was featured in a Prime TV special on the Canadian Broadcast Corporation on the prevention of mental illness among children, which had become, both, which had become epidemic in North America. Also, People Magazine named him a teacher hero for reducing violence and gun violence to young people. Dr. Embry's prevention work is being used at population level in the United States, Canada, Europe, New Zealand, and Australia. He's an Emeritus National Research Advisory Council Senior Fellow in the Commonwealth, and we are thrilled to have him join us today. 
He's also joined by two of his colleagues, Vice President for Paxis Institute, Carmen Irving. Carmen has her master's degree in human development from Kent State University and is a certified family life educator and certified child and youth care professional. Carmen currently serves as the president-elect of the Ohio Council on Family Relations. Carmen's career has been devoted to empowering young youth, sorry, and strengthening families. Throughout her career, she's implemented evidence-based programs and has co-authored several curricula. It's her core belief that all children deserve nurturing adults who help support their success and development. We look forward to hearing from Carmen in a moment. The PAXIS team is rounded out today with Dr. Jason Fruit, the Executive Director of Research and Development for PAXIS Institute. Jason has earned a PhD in education and a master's in special education. He's directed a range of research projects and authored numerous peer-reviewed publications on improving outcomes for children, families, and communities. Jason works to harness the power of neuroscience, behavioral science, and cultural wisdom to create research-based strategies to increase the peace, productivity, health, and happiness for everyone. Welcome presenters, and Dr. Embry, I turn it over to you. And Dr. Embry, it looks sure. like you may just need to go ahead and get your video. Okay, reactive. yes, now we've been on mute. No, we're yes. unmuted now. Okay, so welcome to PAX. I'm really excited to be here and thank you for this wonderful uh, introduction about us. Uh, I hope we can live up to, um, I, it says I need to start my video. So welcome to PAX. I'd like to introduce you to the PAX Good Behavior Game for population level protection and prevention. Normally we don't talk about population level strategies, but I remember that when I was a lad because I went through the polio epidemic and we were all hoping that we would have some way of never having polio and the Salk vaccine came and we lined up and that's disappeared. What we need are behavioral vaccines to help us uh, reduce the problems that all of you who are listening here are well aware of in your communities. Next slide, please. So why does America need this, some simple strategies to prevent and reverse mental, emotional and behavioral disorders? Well, if we don't have healthy, industrious and competent young people, our country will not be able to thrive. Next slide, let me show you some data. So this is the Wall Street Journal and my common joke about the Wall Street Journal is that it's the official publication of the Communist Party, not so. But this paper published on the front page of December 28, 2010, all of the analyses of how many psychotropic drugs were being taken by America's children. Out of 75 million children, at least 40.4 million kids were taking at least one psychotropic medication in 2009. That blew my socks off. I simply could not imagine that that might be true, but it is true and guess what? In the last 10 years, it hasn't gotten smaller. It's gotten worse and let me show you. Next please. So. Uh, this is the age of onset. So we have multiple studies. My colleagues are doing longitudinal studies. And this particular study is in the same area and showing birth cohort trends. And what we're seeing is with every two years, there is an increase in earlier prevalence and higher prevalence of mental, emotional, and, uh, mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. Next, please. Now, what is this costing? for insurance, public insurance and private insurance. So Medicaid is the primary payer for so many kids' mental health and behavioral health and physical health problems. So in uh, 2011, we spent $13.8 million uh, on that. And if you look be before that in 2006, it was $8.9 million. And it's rising presently about $1 billion a year. Next. Now, the other thing to notice is the birth cohorts. So my dad, um, so, sorry, my brother was born in uh, the 1940s. And you can see that the 
probability of him and his generation having um, mental health disorder was about 25% by age approximately 60. But what you can see is as each cohort is born, like in 46 for 40, uh, 1995, and I'm in 48, we see an increase, more and more depression, but earlier and earlier and earlier. And now, what's happening now? Next slide. So what we've seen is we have an enormous epidemic and better than half of our children in America are taking medications in Medicaid and under private insurance. This is all described in great detail in the 2009 Institute of Medicine report, Preventing Mental, Emotional, and Behavioral Disorders Among Young People. And there have been subsequent new ones which come to the same conclusion. So what can we do? Next slide. So we need to consider about adopting prevention and intervention strategies that are medically grade. That means really fine quality research with long-term research. So for example, in our work, we've, we measured kids when they were in kindergarten, and now we have outcome studies when they are age 35. And we are still collecting as they get older, and we're now collecting information on their children. You can find this kind of quality of science at pubmed.gov. That's the National Library of Medicine. And guess what? It's free. All you have to do is click on it and start reading it. And most of the time you can actually read the full articles. So one of the things that we have as a set of principles for designing treatment and prevention and early intervention strategies is the, the strategies need not to be too finicky. They must be relatively easy to learn and be able to use during normal routines. Not necessarily that you have to take every child to a psych hospital can work broadly across people and cultures and languages and settings. It's easy to understand measures of progress and well-being, affordable and very cost-effective. And it needs to be compared with other things to see, oh, this is better than that. That's the kind of science that we are premising our work on. Next, please. So I'd like to show you a video about the implementation of the good behavior game. In 2009, the Institute of Medicine cited this, uh, our work as the single most scientifically proven strategy. And the Centers for Mental Health Services decided, well, can we replicate that in the real world? And they challenged us to replicate in schools that they picked and for us to do the standard implementation that we do with any setting. So hear those results from the actual sites. at the school site in this community. It's something that we definitely never would have imagined that something as easy as playing a game in the classroom would create such great results. Okay. Simon says, hands on your hips. Simon says, hands on your shoulders. The data that talks about the reduction in suspensions, the reduction in expulsions, the reduction in the amount of students receiving mental health uh, therapy uh, is something that absolutely should be everyone's goal. The good behavior game, again, is something that we really didn't have to dedicate a whole lot of time to uh, for it to show the positive results. It just happened. I've seen this game played during an intense math um, lesson and to see that many students, and we have large classes, to see that many students focus. Let's see back hands, everyone and have their eyes on the teacher, I can't wait to see their success. I know that we're gonna have higher test scores. I know that we're gonna have happier kids. I know that we're gonna have happier parents because of this. A pack leader is um, someone that is good at packs. And also a pack leader is when you make people, other people better and you make yourself better, you also make the world better. So this made us very tearful when we saw this video, but it was so powerful to see the impact on children and to hear them speak about it as well as the teachers. So I'm gonna walk, we're gonna walk you through some of the science about this and the outcomes uh, that happened. But most importantly, is you can see that the teachers, the administrators and the children are excited and pleased to be PACS leaders. 
PAX means peace, productivity, health, and happiness. We are not there telling people that they have a diagnosis, that there's some problem with them. We're teaching people to create a positive community in their classrooms, in their whole schools, and spreading them out to their larger world. Next, please. Behavior game. Nope. So Carmen, you're up. Thanks, Dr. Embry. So I wanna um, I wanna shift gears a little bit. I think Dr. Embry does a really good job getting us excited. We look at some of that big data and say, okay, sounds good to me, sign me up. But I wanna make sure that as we spend time together, we're really able to understand what is it we're talking about. So um, at this point, we've heard about PACS Good Behavior Game as an evidence-based practice, but I want to really bring it to life in terms of what does that mean? What would it look like for you and your community? Um, so one of the things Rebecca is going to spend some time talking about is really some of those criteria that are set forth from the Center of Disease Control when we think about bringing an evidence-based practice on board in a community. And so one of the things or those considerations are really around feasibility. So one of the things we wanna share with you is that Pack Good Behavior Game has proven success with similar outcomes in urban, rural, suburban, and indigenous populations. At this point, we have more than 60,000 teachers trained worldwide affecting truly millions of children. And that in these implementations, we're talking about federally funded initiatives, state level, local level, and then also private sources. So as we work through this, we'll talk a little bit about what this looks like at a population level. What does it mean for a statewide implementation? We're also accustomed to doing what we kind of in-house refer to as a onesie twosie situation where we have um, a couple of classrooms or a couple of schools within a district um, implementing. So we think it's important to understand that there's a lot of scalability here. We can bring it down or we can bring it up depending on the unique needs of an individual community. So I want to share a little bit about what we mean with PAX. So PAX is the Latin word for peace. When we talk about PAX in the context of PAX Good Behavior Game or PAX as Institute, PAX means peace, productivity, health, and happiness. In other words, it's what we want more of. It's what we want more for our children, more in our classrooms, more for our families, more for our communities. Specifically, when we're implementing PACS Good Behavior Game, we're increasing peace by reducing stress and anxiety and overall improving the climate. We're increasing productivity by having intentional time on task, increasing focus and performance. When we talk about health, we're really looking at some of those longer term outcomes. We know that when we implement PACS Good Behavior Game, we're reducing substance misuse, uh, reducing those mental health or mental illness diagnoses, and also reducing legal involvement for our children. Obviously, we're increasing happiness. So we're promoting those relationships with peers, with adults, and other individuals within the community. When we talk about PAX Good Behavior Game or PAX Tools, so we're gonna talk about all of PAX today, we're really talking about using those evidence-based kernels which make up the PAX Good Behavior Game and PAX Tools. Evidence-based kernels is a fancy way to say fundamental unit of behavioral influence. When we think about those evidence-based kernels, they're proven and tested, so that's what makes them evidence-based. They're culturally responsive. Again, that goes back to that feasibility point that I was just making. These work regardless of the environment. If we're talking about um, an urban installation or we're talking about a rural installation, they're culturally responsive and they're always trauma informed. PAX hangs on the nurturing environments framework. So when we talk about using PAX Good Behavior Game in our school-based installations, or we talk about PAX tools in our community-based, what we're talking about is creating that nurturing environment. We do that um, by increasing psychological safety and flexibility. We intentionally reduce or minimize those toxic influences. We put limits around problematic behaviors, and though it's one quarter of the nurturing environments framework, it's what people always remember. And that's that we're gonna richly reinforce those pro-social behaviors or those behaviors we want more of. Go ahead and advance it for me, please. Thank you. 
So kind of going large and drilling down into programs, evidence-based kernels, those fundamental behavioral influences, make up both PACS Good Behavior Game and PACS Tools. So I'm gonna spend the bulk of our time here talking about PACS Good Behavior Game, and then as we wrap up today, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about that community-based application of PACS Tools. So thinking about those evidence-based kernels, we take these strategies that have been demonstrated, effective, demonstrated as effective in the science. We put them together and curate them in a collection that shows um, over the course of time making both short and long-term gains. And now we put them together programmatically to train the right people to make those positive changes for our kids. So Pax Good Behavior Game is our signature program that's school-based. But we know that it's not just educators that have impact for kids. And so it's important to Paxis Institute that we sort of share our message of using that youth systems of care model. So what I really want to demonstrate here is that um, we have a variety of programming opportunities that are all rooted in those evidence-based strategies or those kernels that have different applications for different caring adults in the community. So in a school setting, we're going to train the educators in PACS Good Behavior Game. Those educators are going to implement um, within their classroom to uh, reach or affect their students. We're gonna do the same kind of philosophy in a community where we're going to take PACS tools workshops and train community educators who work with um, other caring adults in the community. Oh, I'm, we're going the other way. Um, to train those um, educators to work with parents and foster parents um, in order to, I, I mean, sorry, parents, foster parents, other systems um, providers to make sure that our youth are receiving a shared approach. So in other words, it's just another way to do the strategies outside of a school-based environment. Our newest iteration of that work is PACS Tools for Human Services, which recognizes but there are other places in that system of care model, such as juvenile justice, behavioral health, um, after school environments, um, any of our social rec applications, where again, we have youth workers who are working directly with youth um, who need those evidence-based strategies, but not in a school environment. So the moral of the story is, we have an application to fit anywhere where we're gonna interact with youth based on the science that we've used in the Pax Good Behavior Game. Take it away, Jason. Okay, so with that, uh, we will start our discussion on specifically the Pax Good Behavior Game. And just a, a, as a reminder why we're all here, the Pax Good Behavior Game is an evidence-based practice and, and Rebecca is gonna do a great job of getting into that with us. Uh, in a little bit. So let's hear about how uh, Dennis and the team have constructed uh, the PAX Good Behavior Game. So the PAX Good Behavior Game utilizes those evidence-based kernels that Carmen mentioned. And the evidence-based kernels, once again, that fundamental unit of behavioral influence. So proven behavioral health strategies that are going to uh, improve the productivity and improve the cooperation uh, as it occurs between teacher and child uh, in the Pax Good Behavior Game uh, situation. So as we know, that is a lot of exposure all year long. In fact, most children spend more waking hours with their school teacher than they do their parent each school year. If you think about what that means, just for a second, I'm going to repeat that. Most children spend more waking hours with their teacher than they do during their parent with their parent during the school year. So what a wonderful opportunity uh, to disseminate an evidence-based practice. So they use those evidence-based kernels to set the stage, to curate the environment so that the children are prepared to then receive the greatest amount of effect possible from the good behavior game. And we'll get into that in just a minute and what that looks like. But the good behavior game, as we know, the most powerful mechanism for group change is that interdependent group contingency uh, that we'll talk about in just a minute. 
But by combining those evidence-based kernels with the evidence-based practice of the good behavior game, we have the PAX good behavior game and we create that nurturing environment. And when we have that nurturing environment, we have, of course, that increased academic performance and course improved behavioral performance and what begets or what comes from an improved academic and behavioral outcomes are lifetime outcomes. So what we've seen for schools and classrooms that use the PAX Good Behavior Game, um, that increase in self-regulation, an increase in self-regulation and an increase in pro-social behavior. Uh, so that means children can focus, children can inhibit, children can attend, when children can regulate and attend and have an increased uh, propensity for pro-social behavior, we get, of course, a decrease in problematic behavior. Um, and that decrease in problematic behavior doesn't just mean that uh, the child is a, a little, le little bit less of a pain for the teacher. No, those are actually decreasing the markers for mental and emotional behavioral disorders throughout the lifetime. So what we've learned is that when folks implement the PACS Good Behavior Game along with their instruction in the classroom, uh, we get approximately an additional hour of teaching and learning each day. That means that the teacher doesn't have to worry about stop it, quit it, don't, knock it off, go sit down. If the teacher can teach, we get about an extra hour of learning each day. When students get the Pax Good Behavior Game, we get about a 75% reduction from baseline in their problematic behaviors that they're emitting every minute of every day. So if you think of what an environment looks like and reduce the problematic aspects by three quarters, you have, of course, a much more nurturing environment. We have, of course, an environment like that is going to create the opportunity for an increase in standardized test scores. And if you've created an environment like this, you have one in which teachers are more likely to stick to it. Uh, a, a horrible expense um, financially and a horrible outcome for our educational system right now are teachers uh, who say, I can't do it anymore. That teacher turnover rate, which is about 33% every three years uh, is horribly problematic and often uh, most problematic uh, for our students and children uh, who are most at risk. So uh, when we talk about the acceptability of this intervention, Carmen talked a little bit about the feasibility, like is there evidence that, that this, can, this can work in the area? But what about the acceptability? PAX Good Behavior Game has tremendous acceptability. Uh, first, because of the immediate benefits that the teachers are going to receive. So we count on the teachers as the implementers, and we'll get to an, into a little bit of what that looks like, but the teachers implement this and they get immediate benefits, you know, a, a, a more nurturing classroom, fewer problematic behaviors, children who are on task and a less stressful environment. It's acceptable because the origins are in science and cultural wisdom. This ensures that strategies are fair, logical, and comforting. And what we mean by this is there's not a ton of wrapping paper here. Dennis and Carmen have both mentioned this has been successful on new, multiple continents, multiple countries, multiple cultures. It seems to work everywhere. And that is because it is devoid of the wrapping paper that could get in the way. It is the stripped down science that is then professed within the culture, within the language of the implementers to the participants. And it's acceptable because as Dennis is gonna go on here in a little bit to tell you, its outcomes are sought by communities. It's the things we would all agree on. It's the things that peace, productivity, health and happiness is something we would all say, I want a little more of that, regardless of my culture, regardless of which side of the aisle I'm on politically, we would all agree the things that come from PACs are things we could use a little more of. And finally, I mentioned it a little bit, but the cultural competence of the strategies and the language, it's not wrapped in anything uh, that is going to be going to preclude anyone from taking part in this. It is the science. Um, and, and that's part of what's made it so acceptable. So another thing that we've done to make it so acceptable is we've integrated the PAX Good Behavior Game to not run in addition and certainly not run in opposition, but run in conjunction and integrate well 
with the existing initiatives and programs uh, that the teachers and schools and, and, and communities are already responsible for. And I, I throw some examples for you on here for American schools, the positive behavior interventions and supports, the social emotional learning, the trauma informed classrooms, multi-tiered systems of support are all mandates, all initiatives that current educators are, are having to deal with and have to find a way to do. PACS Good Behavior Game becomes the practical application for these larger uh, initiatives, these larger mandates that, that, that often are a, a bit philosophical, that we, we toss to our educators, we toss to our principals, we toss to our teachers and say, this is how we need to do things now. The PACS Good Behavior Game becomes the operational mechanism to carry those things out, not something additional uh, that they're going to have to do on top of these things. So, um, Quickly, how, how does the PACS Good Behavior Game work? We talked about using those evidence-based kernels uh, to set the stage of a nurturing environment that then eventually kids are going to take part in the PACS game. Um, and we have a number of strategies that are helpful in a number of environments uh, that folks find themselves in the classroom. They make the things you have to do in the classroom go more smoothly. How do I call on kids? How do I get kids to quiet down and give me attention? How do I get kids to calm down once they're wound up? How do I get kids to celebrate their own success and the success of others? How do I get kids to decide what's important and make good decisions? How do I get kids to transition quickly from one area to another? All of these are the things that all teachers are going to find themselves having to do all the time. And what we found is when we use evidence-based strategies to facilitate these things that we have to do every single day, the effects are not just immediate. Well, they are immediate, but the effects are lasting. So how we get this to teachers is we train either uh, in person in different environments. Currently, we train virtually a one day, six hour training where teachers learn to implement these strategies. And for many teachers, as Dennis is gonna tell you in a little bit, this is a, a very powerful experience. And for some, it's a very emotional experience to hear the confirmation of what they've sort of suspected for years to hear strategies that in some instances sound so logical, like, oh, why didn't, why didn't I think of that? Uh, in some instances, hear strategies that sound remarkably way, like ways that your grandmother or great-grandmother uh, was, was so good with you, that cultural wisdom, not just, uh, not just the evidence-based practice side of it, but the origins and the cultural wisdom, because there is wisdom in our ancestors and how we got here and how we learned to, to live together and work together and succeed together. Um, you, you'll see elements of that throughout this. And it's, it's a wonderful experience to take part in a PAX training, uh, especially if you get to take part in it uh, with your peers. So um, we provide in a PAX training, we provide everything you're going to need to do PACs. Everything you need to do to start the very next day is included. You, you, you take a look at a few of these items here, our Hallmark Harmonica uh, that we may get time to talk about just a bit. We have a, a terrific uh, manual that walks you through everything once again, in addition to the training, as well as a wealth of information about uh, behavior and, and neurobiology and all of the makeups that, that kind of get us where we are. And then all of the resources that you could use in order to implement the PACS game in your classroom are included in your bag as well included on the website. So a website is, is another way that we make this uh, so acceptable. So it's not just we train and we're gone. Uh, we begin a relationship with that teacher. We begin a relationship with that implementer uh, the moment that training starts. Uh, and we have the, our, our wonderful website that has a wealth of resources for uh, anything that you could run into uh, in your implementation. We also subscribe to what we call a partnering model. Uh, some fields call it a coaching model, but uh, we equip partners who are further trained to support our teachers. Now, what we know is we can train one teacher in one school and it will be wildly successful. What we do know is that the sky is the limit. If we train additional teachers in that building, we train the entire school, if we can train the entire district, if we can train the entire county, uh, there's going to be 
uh, cascading effects to what we're capable of. And our PACS partners are additionally trained to support that implementation uh, to take that to the next level for things that we can do school-wide uh, and help troubleshoot and then improve implementation. Um, so the last one we'll get to that Dennis is going to talk about here is our utility. Um, does it work? How's it work? The PAX, PAX develops self-regulation in children. That If you leave with one thing today, that would be what to leave with. PAX helps develop self-regulation in children. And as Dennis is going to tell you, PAX makes children the agents of change the agents of change in their own life, the agents of change in the lives of their teachers, their parents, their caregivers, their communities, and it does so by equipping them with self-regulation. And this self-regulation, as Dennis is gonna walk us through, takes us through a cascading effect of immediate, mid-range, and long-term lifetime outcomes. Thank you, Jason, for that really elegant uh, description of our work. It always fills me with pride uh, about what you and other staff have done to expand this. So here's a challenge. Well, first, what I want to say is our work with PAX GBG, when you speak to Indigenous people, they say to us, that's the way we use to support and nurture our children. But we forgot because of all of the oppression, the disease and other kinds of things. It's like giving back to them what they created, the original knowledge of how to raise children. So the state, the, the federal government said, um, we've got a challenge for you. Mm. Do you think if we picked out schools anywhere in America, and we sent you in, could you make significant behavior change in three months in all of those schools? I said, yep, we can do that. So I said, but we don't work for the feds for free. So you gotta pay us. Uh, they set it up and here's what we did. We went into these schools and sites all across America, eight sites. And we took baseline observations. We have an app for that now. We used to do it with just pencil and paper. And we counted how many disturbing, disruptive, and inattentive behaviors there were per 15 minutes. And we did multiple samples uh, within each site, within each classroom. And you can see some of those average. So there's a baseline in the in, uh, school district one of that's about a just about 200 or 185 uh, disturbing, disruptive behaviors per 15 minutes. Then on the next one, on second two, there's about 75 uh, dis disturbing, disruptive. And then we've got one uh, school district, uh, district five, where there's 225 disturbing, disruptive behaviors on average every 15 minutes. There is nothing that would be approaching learning. That, that is the operational definition of classroom hell. And then what you see across the board is we introduced the kernels that Jason outlined. Now the kernels are very, very powerful. Oops. The kernels are very powerful. They cut the disturbing disruptive behaviors in half. And then we played the game for a whole month, every day, a couple of times a day in the classrooms. And now what you see is an enormous reduction of disturbing, disruptive and inattentive behaviors so that the teachers can teach and the children can learn and parents can have confidence in their children and their educators and their schools. But what does that do over the long term? So it improves academics. So we actually see reading scores and math scores go up as a consequence of being able to pay attention. We've also seen state level standardized achievement test scores increase for math and reading regardless of the curriculum. In fact, our math uh, data for effect sizes is larger than most math curricula. Imagine that. Next, please. Now, it also improves teacher well being. Teachers, about half of teachers uh, almost 20 years ago, we knew were on antidepressants. That's higher now. This, it's very stressful. They get agitated, they feel intolerant and irritable and impatient because of all of that chaos. But look what PAX does to reduce teacher stress. And they never had to take meds. 
but now they can teach, they can love their children. Now, what does that do to mental health disorders? So the next, please. So we had a challenge uh, opportunity in Manitoba. They did it uh, province-wide and we took baseline and we were able to categorize the children uh, using a, a medically coded uh, uh, instrument called the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. And what you see are enormous uh, statistical changes in moderate problems among students to moving to low risk. One in a thousand possibility. High problem students moving to moderate risk. Again, one in a thousand probability and very high problem children moving to low risk at uh, one out of a hundred uh, odds. This is extraordinary. This is the same instrument that the United States government uses to measure um, mental and emotional behavioral disorders across this country. Next, please. Is it not moving? Oh. Now, whoop. there we go. So. Here's what that long-term effect is. When you make that classroom change for one, uh, for at least one year, two years better, we can see enormous long-term outcomes. We have samples of about 28,000 children now in randomized control group trials. So college attendance among boys increases 107%. College attendance by girls by plus five, 52%. That's meaning it, the relationship here is the reduction also in pregnancy. High school graduation increases by 25% uh, among girls and 19% among boys. These are all in high poverty areas. Special education services reduced by 26%. There was a 30% reduction in violent crime by highly aggressive boys. Alcohol abuse uh, by boys and girls reduced by 35%. 40% reduction in any psychological services for boys. A 50% reduction uh, in any drug use, a 51% uh, reduction in suicidal thoughts by boys and girls. This is the only elementary school strategy, apparently in the world, to reduce suicidal ideation. We also reduced uh, special ed by 57% uh, and a 60% reduction in antisocial personality disorder in aggressive boys. That's a really heavy lift to do that. Now, here's one thing that's gotten us a lot of attention. This elementary school program done in first and second grade has a 60% reduction in life, 64% reduction in lifetime opiate use. We never talk about drugs, but we do change the heart, the body, and the mind and spirit of children to have a better life. We also reduce tobacco use uh, among boys in multiple forms. Next, please. So, now, Carmen is going to tell you about all the features that we can do to bring PACS, uh, this PAC system to your communities. Thanks, Dennis. So I've been um, monitoring the questions a little bit. It looks like there are a couple of questions. So I'm going to go a little bit out of order. And I know I owe the microphone to Rebecca very soon. So um, I don't want to spray you guys with so much information that it becomes overwhelming. So kind of drawing back up and understanding the big picture, what I want you to leave with today is understanding that from Paxis Institute, we have a variety of evidence-based practices, and we kind of live in two camps. We have our school-based trainings, which is um, the slide you're looking at, um, and so we have that initial teacher training, which is Pax Good Behavior Game. I know that there have been some questions and comments about our partnering model, so we have a distinct training that builds off of that initial teacher training to train folks up in that partnering model. And then we have some additional supplemental um, work for our educators or those working in our schools, which includes the next steps, which is just a variety of professional developments as well as PACS Heroes. I know that there's been some interest in understanding what else exists in the community model. So I'm gonna have Jason jump us over there. It's a couple slides forward in understanding PACS tools. So remember in that shared approach, 
we're taking the science we've learned so much and really honed in our school-based work and now understanding what that application is in communities. So PACS Tools is simply that collection of evidence-based trauma-informed strategies, but now really supporting our parents, our caregivers, and other caring adults who work with children in settings that aren't a classroom. And so I gave some examples of that when I was talking about PACS Tools for Human Services. We have a set of strategies that might be used in our behavioral health world, in our juvenile court system, in our after school or out of school time environments. There was a distinct question asked, like, can you do with this with parents? It stands to reason, right, that if we're doing it with um, caregivers or youth workers and we're doing it with school teachers, we should probably do it with parents as well. And so we certainly do have a model for that. Um, we train, so we don't work directly with parents. What we do is we train community educators. So those are often professionals who work within a um, behavioral health agency, maybe with public health. Oftentimes we have extension educators or whoever the um, parenting educator is for that community comes to Paxis Institute, gets trained, and then is ready to do those community level workshops with parents and caregivers in their home community. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about all the mechanics, but I wanted you to know it exists because I did see that question pop up. We can talk more about the model during the question and answer section of this. With that, Rebecca, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, I'm three minutes over time, so I apologize for that. Thank you, Carmen. So one of the ways that we think about evidence is by using the CDC's understanding evidence framework. And evidence-based decision-making occurs when we use the best available research evidence, and we combine that with the experiential evidence of field-based expertise and contextual evidence. And I think you've heard a lot of that today from our presenters so far. So contextual considerations need to be understood in more detail. And one way to think about this is exploring the feasibility, acceptability, and utility of implementing the best available evidence. And you've heard from our presenters already some of the ways that they think through that. So just to refresh your memory, feasibility is, can it be successful given the resources available and the economic, social, geographical, and historical aspects of the current setting? Acceptability means, will it be accepted by the people and decision makers in that current setting? And the utility means, is it useful for the needs of the people in the current setting? Is it appropriate? So let's talk about a couple of the studies from the PACS Good Behavior Game, and I'll show you the continuum of evidence that we look at to, do, to decide that. So this is an evidence-based best practice spotlight series. And one of the fundamentals for substance use prevention is being able to understand evidence. What we hope to do with this series is, is to draw out how to think through each program, practice, or strategy that is featured from the lens of this framework. This is a fundamental skill and we are seeking to promote this and develop it by applying it to each spotlight throughout the series. So there's never an enhanced understanding of the way that this works to continuously develop the skill of using the best available research experience and context. The continuum of evidence provides a framework for evaluating the best available evidence by considering the strength of the evidence and the effectiveness of the program. The framework is structured with the effectiveness of programs on a continuum across the top from harmful to well-supported. The strength of evidence along the left side of this figure is measured by evaluating the external ec ecological validity, implementation guidance, independent replication, the type of evidence and research design, internal validity, and effect. And for a more in-depth discussion of this framework, please see the ADAPT YouTube channel with the recording of the Understanding Evidence webinar. For this particular spotlight, there are several published studies on the good behavior game. They focus on different components of the program and alignment with the needs of prescriber of people and the national guidelines. Some of the published studies focus on different populations, such as school-based implementation. If you want to further explore PACS GBG, you can find more information on a research supplement for that. For the purposes of this review, we're going to focus on two of the studies that may be most helpful to you as you decide whether to bring this intervention to your community. These are the ones you should pay more attention to because they are probably more relevant to what you may want to do. So this first article on this slide is a comparison of variable and person-oriented approaches in evaluating a universal preventive intervention. It included 197 schools that were randomly assigned within school divisions to implement PACS in either 2011 or 2012 school year for the PACS schools or the following year for the waitlist control schools. 
The sample available for analysis included 3,393 students from 225 classrooms in 144 participating schools. Post-test analysis was completed for over 2,000 students with pre-test and post-test data. And both PACs and control students increased significantly in pro-social behavior with a significantly greater increase for the PACs group than for the control group. Both groups had significant decreases in hyperactivity with a significantly greater decrease in the PACs group than in the control group. And there were significant improvements in emotional symptoms, conduct problems, or peer relationships in the PACs group that were not seen in the control group. Overall, when gender, socioeconomic status, and pretest risk status was accounted for, boys with higher pretest level of conduct problems had a significant decrease after the program. In this second article, Promoting After School Quality and Positive Youth Development, a Cluster Randomized Trial of the PACS Good Behavior Game, the study examined the PACS GBG among 76 after school programs serving over 800 youth ages 5 through 12 who were in diverse in race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and geographic locale. Higher fidelity implementation sites were characterized by staff using less harsh language, more supportive relationships among adults and children, and higher levels of youth engagement. The PACS GBG program alone effect, affected observed belonging. These outcomes are all clearly targeted in PACS GBG. PACS GBG also has an influence on children's pro-social behavior such as caring, sharing, and listening. And when PACS GBG was implemented with fidelity, children reported less hyperactivity, for example, ability to stay seated and pay attention. Next slide, please. So this slide shows us how we use the continuum of evidence of effectiveness. So based on the information provided in the two peer review journal publications in particular, but also in some of the other ones that you heard about today, PACS Good Behavior Game may be evaluated on these six dimensions of the evidence. And for reference, those six dimensions are on the left-hand side of this chart. The first dimension is effect. PACS Good Behavior Game was found to be effective as demonstrated by a decrease in staff using less harsher language, as we just talked about. And when PACS Good Behavior Game was implemented with fidelity, remember the children had less hyperactivity and they were able to stay seated and pay attention. Internal validity was demonstrated with these two experimental studies using randomized control trial designs. The independent replication domain is demonstrated by replication of PACS Good Behavior Game in multiple other settings and studies, as Carmen noted, and with similar outcomes. An implementation guidance is provided by PACS Good Behavior Game and has been studied in other GBG evaluation studies, reviewing various training and coaching interventions. And the last domain is well supported through multiple pragmatic or real world settings with rigorous evaluations that have demonstrated the external ecological validity. So we're going to wrap up this second section. I'm going to hand it back over to Jason, Dennis, and Carmen, and just ask them to reiterate and give some real world examples about how they think through the feasibility, the acceptability, and the utility for PACS GBG as the program was designed and considering implementation strategies. Thanks, Rebecca. First, Rebecca. Oh, sorry, go oh, ahead, Carmen. Go, no, go ahead, Dennis. I, um, I was simply going to share that um, we certainly have these slides to outline feasibility, acceptability, and utility, um, but I'd love for the three of us to be able to tackle all three areas of this because um, I think this is our opportunity to really help people uh, bring it to life. So I want to make sure they hear from more than just me, Dennis. So it sounded like you had something to share. Do you want to get us started on feasibility? Well, I was just so delighted by the presentation about all of this. Uh, normally these things don't get talked about, but from the very beginning when we looked at this, we wanted to package it so that it could be sustainable in any place it landed. Now that changes how you design and build something. So there are lots of design redundancies inside of Pax GBG. So the feasibility when somebody anywhere in the world starts to use this, they will tend to see immediate effects and then that reinforces them to dig into more and to actually try it more and uh, implement more pieces of it. So if you have a, a program or a practice that is so tight that you can't vary, they have no wiggle room, it, that will be too hard to implement at a public health level. And that's what we're aiming at is something that can be implemented anywhere in America, North America, Europe, whatever. Thanks. 
So we talked about uh, the acceptability is something that we kick around as a team all the time, every day. The, this construct is really uh, part and parcel to what we do. Um, it, like Rebecca shared, the evidence is overwhelming. Go type in good behavior game and packs good behavior game in, in PubMed and then, then take the week off work because that's what it's going to take to read all of the evidence uh, coming back. Yeah. Uh, showing, showing how that went. Um, but what we do know is if the teacher, in this case, who's the implementer, doesn't implement, then we don't get the benefit. So we've worked overwhelmingly hard to make this, uh, quote unquote, acceptable uh, to the teacher as the implementer. And, and again, I have to emphasize, of course, we didn't go into the nuts and bolts of how, how this is implemented, um, but essentially, we train teachers to use these evidence-based strategies, to use the evidence-based kernels and then the PAX game um, in the stead of some less effective, uh, for lack of a better term, classroom management strategies. So we trade these research-based strategies for um, what, what they may be trying to do to quiet children down or get children lined up or get kids focused. Uh, we use these strategies and then with the interdependent group contingency of the PAX game, that is where the children truly collaborate. They work together. That is something they don't need the teacher to do. This is something they're doing right now to be the agents of change when we do that game. That's when they're truly extending that self-regulation. But once again, we can't do that without the teacher uh, implementing. Uh, so that's why we work every day to make this acceptable. A couple of things that I would add to this is that some of what we learned is from direct observation of uh, kids and families in indigenous communities. I took the time to figure out what, what happened in the real world before all of the modern environment and paid attention to that and put it into what we're doing, which is why the indigenous people look at this and they go, oh, this is the way we used to do things but forgot. And that to me is a great honor. The other place that I learned a great deal from is working with Sesame Street and Children's Television Workshop. Because what you will see inside of PAX GBG is we are not doing to children. We are doing with ch children. They are co-creators and co-implementers with this project. So it's not a discipline program. It's a joining together to achieve the things that the children want, the teachers want, and families want, and communities want. I'm gonna, oh, before we go to utility, I was gonna just add one more thing. I mean, you gave me microphone privileges, so I wanna use them. Um, I, okay. wanna, I wanna come from another lens. I remember coming to my first PAX training, just trying to really understand what this is and what this isn't. And um, for our, our webinar attendees, I wanna kind of help you get your mind wrapped around this because this is very unique. I think when we, um, are in the business of doing community level prevention work, we're accustomed to buying a curriculum. And what we're doing is we're getting trained in that. And now we're hoping to be able to implement. And so I think in most cases, when we're accustomed to doing work in conjunction with schools, we're thinking about it as a manualized curriculum. And that means that we're going to take it off the shelf and we're going to use it Tuesday at two o'clock. That's not what this is. And that's why you see such um, different outcomes than what we're accustomed to doing in programming in schools. And the reason I bring that up under the heading of acceptability is that's what has made this so acceptable or palatable for our educators, is that this isn't another thing they're doing. What they're actually doing is teaching school. What they're using yeah. is leveraging those behavioral strategies, those evidence-based strategies within their daily context of doing school. And so those 10 strategies before we get to the good behavior game are really about how do we do school with our kids? Oh, thanks, Patty is putting some resources in there. How do we do school with our kids using these evidence-based behavioral health strategies? So I think that's, that's helpful because I think it can feel daunting to think about getting trained in one more thing in hopes that we're gonna get our teachers to do it. What's made it so acceptable is that one, it's just doing their, their, their daily routine. Two, they see immediate change in their classroom and so they'll do more of it.
Go ahead, Dennis. I know you wanted to talk about utility. Uh, I, you summed it up very uh, well. What we've tried to do is engineer it from the very beginning that it was highly impactful with children. They enjoyed it. They liked it. And what teachers say is, oh, I'm having fun again. I enjoy my children again. And that creates the incredible bond between students and educators and families. And that we have lost in modern society. And this builds that back. And the children are always the center of attention and actual implementation. And then of course, from a utility aspect, like we said, does it do what it set out to do? Is it addressing actual needs of the community and uh, you know, we believe the research indicates that resoundingly yes is that um, when we can affect those uh, immediate outcomes like a child's focus, a child's ability to attend, a child's ability to decrease their problematic behavior, all of this being active mechanisms on their own to, in developing self-regulation, the impacts and the, the long-term effects of improved self-regulation uh, are, are resounding and well-written. All of us remember uh, our Psych 101 course when we learned about the marshmallow test. Uh, what yeah. the, the lifetime outcomes of someone who can regulate, who can inhibit behavior versus someone who has more difficulty inhibiting behavior. Once we found out that that self-regulation, the ability to inhibit behavior is actually malleable, we can affect it, we can improve it, we can change it, um, we have a responsibility to do so because we know the lifetime outcomes uh, of children who have this improved self-regulation, both from the immediate term, uh, again, those immediate uh, impact, those immediate outcomes are, are what improve the acceptability for the teacher. You know, they, they, they scratch the itch, you know, they improve the classroom. Uh, uh, little does she know she's having a resounding lifetime, out, uh, lifetime effect on that child. One of the outcomes that uh, folks may not be aware of is that in our long-term studies, we actually show the reversal of adverse childhood experiences and prevent future adverse childhood experiences. Okay, I think, you know, we've made it through our slides now and I'd like to uh, invite Carmen and the rest of our panelists back. It looks like we have some really good um, uh, questions here that, that our rest of our panelists are, are eager to get to. So let's spend the rest of our time with that. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Carmen. Wonderful overview of the behavior game as well as other past tools. Really appreciate you fleshing that out for us a little bit. I know that you barely skimmed the surface, quite honestly, on much of what you've got, right? But I appreciate you keeping it succinct and helping us understand at that macro level what's in store for those who'd like to pursue additional training on this. We do have two questions. I'm going to merge them, the first two, and then we've got another one that relates to nonprofits. The first couple really revolve around clarification on the ages that are being targeted with good behavior games. So if we could just clarify that for the audience and then speak to within the age range that is targeted, are specific adaptations encouraged? Um, and made available through the training to make it age appropriate. So to answer that question, uh, it is clear that it is operational and effective from preschool age all the way through uh, secondary school. We've actually done uh, the implementations in junior highs and high schools. The difference is that as you get older, uh, you increase the, there are some additional things that you add to the uh, intervention that make it a little bit more um, having an adult flavor for the children to have meaningful roles in helping implement all of these things, but the structure of the game and most of the things don't change at all uh, because it's, it's fundamental to the way humans uh, organize their child rearing uh, over the lifetime, but we're happy to share some of those um, details uh, subsequently. 
We have a great paper on meaningful job roles about it, actually. Thank you for that. Jason, do you want to add to any of that? Or yeah, well, our, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just add that um, um, the, a lot of the, the, our standard training is going to be targeted at K through six, and that is where I'll, uh, yeah. the, the bulk of the foundational evidence that you will find when you go to pubmed.gov and, and search the evidence is going to be in the K through six range, that is, uh, sort of the focus of the training. Um, yeah. But as we like to say, these evidence-based strategies and the evidence-based kernels that make up the PACS good behavior game and make up PACS tools uh, are, are just good human behavioral science. And you'll see it in there. We packaged it in a way that makes sense to sort of the lower grades teacher a little bit. But in our PACS manual uh, that comes with the training, there are extension recommendations for different age group, both below down to the non-readers and then above in the secondary school, as Dennis mentioned. So that is in our manual. Carmen, did you have something you wanted to add as well? No, I was saying, thank you. Well done, Jason. But then yeah. I was muted. So, Laura, I think there was another age question, age. correct? I, I combined them already. Yeah. Okay. One was clarification on ages and one was how you might adapt the strategies or the individual interventions. The one There's a question about tax partners. Go ahead, Laura. So I, I think for the and hi Martine, Martine. <laughs> we've worked with Martine through Adapt, and thank you for your question, Martine. Martine runs a nonprofit that works within the school system in her area in South Carolina, and she's wondering if you all partner with organizations like hers to disseminate and implement the program, and what that partnership might look like. Um, I'm going to do my best to answer this, and if I don't get it, let me know, Laura, and I'll try it a different way. So um, when we think about a PACS partner, the goal is to augment their skills after they've been through the initial teacher training to really help them develop their own PACS expertise to be able to support implementation within the school. And what I can say is that there's a lot of variety in what PACS partnering looks like based on the individual needs of a school or a district or a community um, or a region. Thank you for saying you love PACS expertise, Patty. That's Jason's least favorite word. So I told you it was a good word. Um, so all that to say, our role at PACS Institute is to meet our um, trained PACS partners where they are and help really support fidelity implementation. What I mean to say by that is that we don't hold um, a strict line in terms of what that needs to look like. We, we understand that every community has varying needs and so it's our role to help support the partners to be able to support the teachers so that we have good fidelity implementation. And so um, the short answer I think is Yes, that's what we're here for. And so the ways in which we do that um, began with that initial PACS partner training. Um, just like we continue to support our educators, we also support our partners. And so we have monthly webinars, we have monthly newsletters, um, we have sort of like the butterball turkey line. We have a couple of folks um, who really, that is their role is to support the partners. We wanna make sure that that initial investment in implementation that's been done in the schools has what they need to be successful. So sometimes there are questions about, wait, what's going on with this kernel? It's not working or how do we do or it's backwards or I don't remember. Sometimes and more often than not, it's about um, not so much what I would call the spot check of the kernel, but how do we better utilize the data or what the school is really interested in is um, reducing teacher stress. How do we how do we begin to look at that? And so that's a lot to ask of a community partner. That's a that's you know big. So that's really where Paxis Institute partners with those partners to help support that. Also, that, we, haven't, we haven't mentioned it, but I will say, please, please, please go visit uh, www.paxis.org. 
Uh, we have a, a brand new website that has a wealth of resources and materials even before you get you you pay to be trained. There's uh, videos and explanations and uh, from the community-based side to the school-based side. So so please investigate our pretty new website uh, and, and check it out. You can find all kinds of information there as well. Yeah, we really love having community partners help spread this and support it. Yeah. It makes it more powerful. It in fact improves the outcomes of the kids uh, and the families dramatically and it, it actually reduces the overall cost of services that may be necessary in a given community by having that partnership because you can have consistency in the school setting, you can have it in the after school settings, you can have it under the therapeutic environments, you can have it even in the, in the delivery of personalized uh, behavioral health uh, strategies. So we thought about that and we wanted to make it, make it fluid so that it could flow without difficulty between with the families, with the instructors, with the teachers, with the community, larger community. Dennis, Carmen, and Jason, one thing that has consistently struck and stuck with us here at ADAPT since learning a little bit more about kernels and not necessarily the behavior game, but about the foundational mechanisms, right, of the good behavior game. And just putting it together, you know, it's been an evolution of thought for us here on the ADAPT team. But what we really appreciate, and I think what turned us on to doing a deeper dive into kernels and synthesis of kernels, right, through programs like Good Behavior Game, was the fact that just one kernel, one micro-level intervention, right, one of those on your tiered list of like the toodle strategy, mm -hmm. just one of those is evidence-based, right? That all of them Correct. come from some form of study, right? That has its own foundational evidence base and you've synthesized them. But another thing that, that we have just, it's been impressed upon us that you're right, there are a lot of curriculum-based programs that are implemented and are very structured, right, in that implementation. But we've been considering doing a webinar on ways of being with youth and just talking through some of those fundamental ways of interacting with them and just being present with them and what that might look like. And the good behavior game and the way you guys have described it really speaks to a way of being with Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, well, you're actually speaking at a very spiritual level to me about this. Uh, we wanted to devise things that almost anyone could understand, anyone could make use of. And I took my foundation from that, from the work with the Maori people in New Zealand. Uh, I really wanted to discover how did they manage to do what they did with their kids and their families. And what you learn is there is a wisdom from grandmas. Then my question is, well, what's the wisdom that grandmas and grandpas have? And as you spoke to them and you observed the actions, you could see the continuity across cultures. And so we have, we at the same time we were building with the science, at the same time we were listening to the origins of humanity. And we put those two things together, quite frankly, with a spiritual purpose of wanting to heal who we are and what we are on this world and planet. And it's contagious <laughs> uh, having people see that they can do these things and giving them these tools you don't have to have a diagnosis for. I mean, that drives me insane as a, as actually a licensed clinician is like, do you have to have a diagnosis before you can help a child? Well, hell no. Uh, <laughs> you can do the right thing. And so that's part of our purpose and building in clear measures that can be had in real time with real people. And if we can continue to do that and expand that, then there are so many things that we can do. I, I've mentioned in the past to you that there are recipes for kernels uh, that have for, in, in fact, for addictions themselves. The 
Nancy Petrie's prize bowl is the single most scientifically proven strategy to reduce most addictions. And it has the same principles inside of it as the good behavior game. And in fact, we've, we've actually implemented it at a community level uh, here in Arizona. So if we can then share these tools widely, we believe that there can be population level impact to better America and better the world. Laura, I, I think I'll share um, something in, in a similar vein, but a, a very different um, tact maybe. And, and that's honestly on a personal note. Um, the, Rebecca and Patty and Laura have certainly done their homework and wouldn't have provided no. um, a spotlight spot if the evidence weren't there. And, and you've got three folks who will talk about the evidence all day long. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> but I think when you start talking about um, the state of being, I don't want to talk about the evidence. I want to talk about my personal experience. And my personal experience is that I'm a mother of two. Um, and I'm also the on again, off again foster mother for my two nieces and the experience that my biological children have had is very, very, very different than that of my two nieces. My children have had scaffold success and the resources they've needed to be successful, and I wanna continue growing that. I wanna make sure that I'm using those strategies that give me more of what I want that launch them into their future. I want those opportunities for my nieces as well. I think when we talk about a state of being, um, we are in most cases equipped to run to the interventions for those particular kids. And what I appreciate about PAX, and it's how I came to PAXIS, long before I came to PAXIS, I was a customer of PAX. So, you know, I was on the other side of this. So I think it's truly my own lived experience in one watching the effects of having PACs at a community level, PACs at a school level, and PACs at a familial level um, that, that sort of made me a believer. Having seen those individual strategies be effective with my own children, and then being able to have a shared approach um, for my nieces, kids who needed it the most, and they're the same strategies, um, is a powerhouse. And I think on, when I talk about the adults, um, it's a relief to our teachers. It's a relief to our youth workers. It's a relief to our caregivers when we're not asking them to use a variety of strategies. It's the same set of strategies. Um, but the power for that, for me on a personal level, is that my niece who really was a, a high intense, like a, a, an intensive case, um, got to see herself through the same lens that my daughter got to see herself. And rarely are we in a situation where what we would consider our at-risk youth um, have the privilege to see themselves in that light. And I think that's what we're really getting at when we talk about a state of being is that we're gonna take a strengths-based approach we're gonna wrap these kids in protective factors. We're going to reinforce pro-social behavior. We're gonna hold the line and intentionally create a nurturing environment for all kids. Um, that's the state of being. Yeah. And I think, couldn't, couldn't have said it better, Carmen. Thank you for, for sharing that personal interaction with PAX. And that's, I think when we, when you, have an instrument that so that affects and impacts such a fundamental aspect of the human experience that comes with self-regulation and cooperation you know it is it is more than more than the science and it is you know more than the studies you know i i um i couldn't help you know the first time uh i met dennis you know i was the the very rigid BCBA uh, <laughs> sitting in the back of the classroom saying, ah, you, you didn't quite get that one. That's not how I would say it. And then it, it, it sort of, over time, uh, he wore on me and it dawned on me about bringing this to the implementers, 
The implementers are the teachers. The implementers are the parents and caregivers. The implementers is our society at large because that's who uh, is going to bring about the next generation. And that's how generations past have been able to perpetuate and been successful is that when all of the elders, all of the adults come together uh, on common ground uh, to improve uh, the community. Um, you know, I, I, I have my own story of how my, uh, my grandmother who completed the seventh grade in Kentucky and to my knowledge did not execute any uh, single subject design nor randomized control <laughs> trials um, for, for when I would argue and fight with my, my brother um, at her house. Uh, would pull us aside and whisper into my ear, hey, I, can you help me with something? This is kind of a grown-up thing, but can you help me with it? I need you to run out to the garden and get me the best cucumber you can find. Do you know what the best cucumbers look like? And if you get back here before it's time to din for dinner, I can give you a cookie before dinner, but you have to take your brother. You <laughs> have to play nice. So... My grandmother with her, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade education, you know, fast forward all these years later, she was implementing evidence-based kernels. She didn't know she was implementing evidence-based kernels, but, but she was. And that's where that, that marriage of the cultural wisdom uh, along with the science comes together. And I'm, I'm so, so elated that Patty, Laura, and Rebecca brought us together yes. and, and, and saw and detected those synergistic effects of evidence-based strategies that, that we work so hard uh, to bring together and make acceptable for everyone. Absolutely. There's a little story. I helped design a new therapeutic preschool here in uh, Tucson 25 years ago. And uh, the state people and the insurance company people came and they came, oh, this is really marvelous. And then they said, but this is like really simple stuff that you're doing and you know there's like we're not talking you know we're not talking Freud to the you know the little kids and so on but we're doing kind of like what Jason said and responding to the kids and I said well golly we we could do this you know and wouldn't we have to pay that much money and we said well the reason you're paying that much money is because you never did any of these things if you had you wouldn't have to pay us <laughs> So uh, there's such truth in this that the true prevention about this is not about punishment. It's about creating predictability for peace, productivity, health, and happiness in daily routines so that children can learn those things. That doesn't mean that everything will be perfect. Um, that's why we you know, count spleens. It helps children realize that they made an error, but an error is not a sin. It's just an error. And everyone makes flames just like everyone poops and passes gas. And if you can have that lightness of being as a parent, as a teacher, as a clinician, we have the possibility of achieving great things and for the promise of America. And I hope the world. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for all of your comments today. I'll leave everyone with the latest area that we've been interested in exploring is intentional culture change with some of the activities that we put together through ADAPT and we're still fleshing that out, but this definitely seems to be a, a contributing variable, a very promising program for that intentional culture change and that it incorporates those origins, right, of, of family units and ways of being mm -hmm. with youth. Um, but also, you know, it's very, it's very complementary to a lot of other strategies as well that can yes. be integrated to create a, a full prevention continuum, if you will, in the community. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dennis, Th there's Cohen. no corner on the good. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, thank you all so much. From the bottom of our hearts here at ADAPT, I know that you have volunteered not time just for this webinar, but multiple um, events for us. And so it's, we thank you for freely giving up that time and for sharing uh, a lot of these details with some of our viewers. Patty, I'll hand it back to you. Mm.
All right. So on that note, again, just want to thank our presenters again. Thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, just a couple of housekeeping to items to wrap this up. Once the webinar ends, you'll receive a post-presentation evaluation. You'll just have to click the link and it'll generate that, um, that website for you. And we would really appreciate if you could take just a couple minutes to share your feedback. Or there's also an opportunity in there to write down what else or what more related to this topic, this strategy that you would like to hear, to learn about, to receive. And we'll get that information to our presenters also, you um, will be able to indicate if you'd like to receive continuing education credits for today's events. And in doing so, you'll just have to provide your name and your email so we know who to make that certificate out to and where to send it. Um, we will be sending a follow-up email following today's event with a recording link and an updated resource supplement um, within one to two days after the webinar. And that's it for housekeeping. So on behalf of the ADAPT team and our presenters, I want to thank you for joining us today and wish everyone a wonderful rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you.